This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin, and with me this week are two stupendous human beings, Kara Shamborsky. Hey. And Kate Scotchless. Hello. You know, I'm super glad to be back. I'm super glad to be talking about comic books with the both of you this week. But before we get into anything, I need to talk about last week's episode. I need to talk about the insubordination on this comic book <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I need to talk about how I genuinely didn't see a show like that coming and it made me like want to cry. I genuinely teared up in the middle of it. There was some incredibly nice things said to me and I have to fight the urge to not cry right now because it is it was so nice and I I don't know what else to say other than thank you. You guys are fantastic. Um, Thank you to everyone who sent us things on Twitter about the books that they were inspired to read because of the show and because of my influence. I, I didn't realize that like this weird and like animated thing that I do about comic books to try to hype everyone else up actually had some positive impact. I was just I'm just trying to keep the show going and like be excited about comics every week. And I'm glad to hear that it's had like a positive impact on people. And it's gotten, you know, my friends on the show to read other things. So um, thank you to Kate and Paul and Nick. You guys are pretty stupendous. Um, uh, it was it was quite an episode to listen to. I It really made me feel good. And on top of the fantastic thing of me going and getting married to my best friend in the entire world. So, um, man, what a, what a fucking... What a week I've been having. Well, first, <laughs> it's been stupendous. First of all, Mike, you're forgetting some credit. <laughs> Or did I put the who did, no. I, did I credit the wrong person? No, 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 no. But oh, okay. It was Tia's idea for them to hijack the show, and then Son. I would like some credit for me and Xander creating the most magical yes. emoji laden tweets in the world. We literally spent totally. while, while we were producing the show last week. We literally spent ten minutes or maybe 15 minutes on the Friday tweet being like, okay, how many sparkles can we fit in this tweet before Twitter cuts us off? Should we yeah. frame Mike's name with unicorns and sparkles with just unicorns? What kind of cow emojis can we put in this without going yeah. over the limit? <laughs> I will say one of the other amazing things that's happened over the past three or four weeks is that Kara and Xander have been taking over some producing responsibilities for me because i'm we're basically prepping for me to be gone for another three weeks in october and so because i'm going to japan for my honeymoon which is going to be really cool so kara and xander have been doing some like practice runs of producing like while mike isn't here what all do we need to do and they've been doing a great job the twitter account is never been better so (laughs) i want to say thank you guys for doing that you you honestly have like made like re- remove some worry from my shoulders of, of something else that I needed to do on top of my wedding. It was a little bit stressful. People that were at the wedding may have saw, may have seen like a little bit of twinge of worry and stress and anxiety on my shoulders leading up to the actual ceremony itself. Um, but as soon as it happened, it was like all gone and like you guys just removed one extra thing and I needed to worry about. So I do thank you both for doing such a fantastic job. The show has, has, ran smoothly and i love it i i can't believe that i can just let this thing go and it'll actually function without me it's a hard thing to realize and i it's all because of the two of you and everybody else doing such a great job on the show like holy cow i i really can't thank both of you enough for it mike speaking of you too oh (laughs) mike speaking of your upcoming honeymoon in japan i learned a fun fact that i think will be of great importance to us all and That fact is at Universal Studios in Japan, they have a Harry Potter section, but the Harry Potter section is different than the U.S. versions because they have an owl cafe. So you can be in the Harry Potter section of Universal Studios in Japan and be surrounded by real life owls while you're eating your food. And I don't know how how many germs you want to let yourself be exposed to, but I'll be exposed to a lot of germs to be surrounded by real life owls. The dumbest well, I know birds ever. I'm definitely going to have to change some plans around to make that happen. <laughs> Holy cow! I didn't know that that was a thing. I just found out this week. That's that's amazing. I'm I'm going to tell Kelly, and I'm pretty sure we're going to change some things around to make that happen. <laughs> but okay, Kate, I don't know if you wanted to jump in here at all. <laughs> I know you were at the wedding, so you saw everything. Did I see everything? It turns out <laughs> I was in the back. Um, and there were tall people in front of me, but I felt the magic in the air, nonetheless. <laughs> and <laughs> then I got to see you later, which was great. It was, yeah. a, like, the weather was amazing. You had the perfect day. It was yeah. a very yeah. nice 
very nice event. And then I got to see everyone, which was nice because I have moved all the way far away, an hour away, which means that I like never see Nick and Paul and those guys. So yeah, it yeah, great. it was cool. We did get a really cool like IRCB photo for the people that could attend. Um, unfortunately, Kara and Tia couldn't, but that's okay. We will we will do a family photo again sometime in the future of everybody. The next time we all get together in like two years or something Emerald like City. that. <laughs> Emerald City. We're trying. We're trying. But anyways, let's let's we got to move on. I, Hold I, as much on. As I do we don't. Love, we don't. Oh, There's one okay. more thing that the masses need to know. Okay. By far the best wedding like uh take home gift that i've ever gotten came from your wedding customized dice people that Stop. celebrate the love <laughs> on a d6 of mike true. and kelly with the date in their wedding colors of yeah. purple and gray they were fantastic and did we sit at the table spinning them and making dice towers of course we did of course <laughs> I, I forgot. Yeah, there was there was that. We had a we had a little like chibi character drawn thing made by a friend of ours named uh, Shannon. Uh, it's it's cute as hell. It's my like profile picture on Twitter. Um, if anybody wants something like that, Shannon is incredible. I can send you her contact information. I love her to death. She it's a, one of the best gifts we got from the wedding by far. But okay, as much as I like talking about myself, um, I we got to stop. We got to talk about the thing we're actually here to talk about every single week. And that is comic books. So let me ask you those two wonderful questions I always ask. How have you been? And how have comic books been? Let's start with you, Kara. Mike, I'm so tired. How do people be social? <laughs> how do social extroverts? Uh, caffeine. <laughs> yes. Lots and lots of caffeine. I'm dying. Uh, no, I've, I've had a, a, a great time. I saw the Downton Abbey movie this weekend. <gasps> and How was it? It was so delightful and so delightful to see it in a theater full of people who are clearly huge fans of the show because everyone laughed at all the same moments and it was just kind of like a giant midday slumber party of everyone just being super into what was happening. And basically, they t the Downton Abbey film seems like they said, if we were to do a season seven, these are all the things that would happen, but we're going to make them all happen in two hours. So it okay. was very rapid fire, but if you are a fan of the show, you will love the movie. Everything that comes out of the Dowager Countess's mouth is gold. And oh, so it, <laughs> it, it was lovely. And I saw it in the San Francisco Alamo Drafthouse Cinema. So we like sat down and got to order food and drinks and they were brought to us and the theater was like gorgeous and full of all these like beautiful ornate carvings and it was just a very luxurious moving going experience but my actual ticket was only like twelve dollars which i thought was great wow yeah very nice so it was splendid um in terms of comics so mike got me reading fence from boom studios and volume three was finally available at my local library so i reserved it and i read it and my same reaction to the ending of volumes one and two, which is, God damn it, where's the next one? <laughs> so, um, and uh, my overwhelming sentiment when I read these books is just make out already. But like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess friendship is also fine. But like two of the main characters have like so much tension in volume three that they end up like fighting in a closet and two other characters like find them kind of like sprawled out on the floor and they're mid fight, but it could also be something else. And I was just like, oh, just kiss him. So, <laughs> but like, I'm, like, I promise I'm fine if they're just friends. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But also like, you could kiss. <laughs> like, would that be the end of the world? So uh, I really enjoyed volume three kind of adding to the like character relationships and tensions at this boys academy as these boys try to make the fencing team and so mm -hmm. in volume three you actually find out who does make the fencing team for the year kind of setting the stage for one assumes this comic taking us through uh the rest of this this school year and uh before we started recording today mike mentioned that they're actually moving from a monthly floppy format to a trade format is that accurate i i feel like that was the last bit of news that i read that may have changed but yeah they're i think they're moving to doing standalone like volumes rather than just putting out issues uh, which is which is totally fine by me i love getting a lot of content at once Oh, totally. If I was waiting month to month for this book, I think I'd scream because I'd get to the end and just be like, why? Why is it so short? Why isn't there more? It's great character work, great 
um, building out of some of the character relationships in this issue and adding a little more nuance to characters we've only seen caricatured up to this point. And again, if you're a fan of sports manga, you will love this book. What if you're not usually into manga? Would you recommend this for people who are comics but typically not manga people? Is it kind of crossover-y in that sense? Yeah, it's very much an American-style comic book. Okay. But it, a lot of the uh, visual uh, elements that they use and some of the um, formatting is very sports manga like there's okay. when when they're explaining when something is happening in the on the fencing strip a character will kind of say something super expository that maybe they wouldn't necessarily say in that setting in real life but you as the reader need that information to understand the stakes of what's happening right in the sports mm -hmm. so you could go like i went into this not really knowing anything about fencing but they explain it enough as I go so I can feel like, ah, yes, this is a crucial match point. Like, you know, when you're watching <laughs> Great British Bake Off and at the end of an episode, you're like, yes, the consistency on that <laughs> <laughs> that souffle is wrong. It's like if they make you oh, an yeah. amateur armchair expert as you go. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm loving the art. The colors are very cheerful and the facial expressions are like generally kind of more western style but there are interspersed with some more exaggerated manga-esque faces that i think mm -hmm. do a great job of telegraphing emotions in a really succinct way yeah kate i think you would fall right in love with this book i, I got think, a feeling i think that it does sound more like something i should try than some of the other mangas um I need to get a yeah. library card in my current locale, but the thing yes. about that is I need to go to the Secretary of State's office and change my driver's license. And you know how often you feel like going to the Secretary of State's office? Never. Never. <laughs> yeah. Never. <laughs> so therein lies the conundrum. I got my local library to give me a library card using my work address or my, dress, my address on my um, paycheck, so... Yeah, sometimes mm. you just need, like, a bill. If you bring a bill addressed to you at a certain address, they'll be like, oh, that's enough proof to know that you live in this county or whatever. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I might so. do that. I Yeah, there's, like, I have, a, like, a list forming of things that I want to read that are, like, more recent, but also mm -hmm. I definitely can't just spring for a bunch of graphic novels and, you know, tr trades and all that. Oh, that totally. Adds up Girl, I got all, all mine from the library. Do it from the yeah, library. Yeah, same. That's my usual thing. So I, my default right now has been going and getting stuff on Hoopla, but of course that doesn't have the most recent stuff, so. I will say, Kate, that the first six issues of Fence are on Comixology Unlimited, so you could check it out there to start. <sighs> my God. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to help a friend. But you know what, Kate? <laughs> how about you? How have you been? How have comic books been? I have been great. I can't wait to tell you guys about this underground comic I discovered called Mr. Miracle. <laughs> speaking, speaking of Hoopla, I went on there and was like, oh my gosh, it's on Hoopla now. And, you know, clicked borrow and read 200 pages when I intended to read two issues. Uh, I can yeah. see why this got all the awards. Yeah. And my... Uh, I don't really need to go into it, I don't think, because everything everyone has said everything about this comic, and they're all right. And the thing that I'm uh, bestowing upon you, our listeners, is the fact that it's on Hoopla now. So if you, like me, had missed this and don't have $18 to throw at the trade, especially because it's a trade paperback right now, mm -hmm. and I would assume that you would want this in hardcover... Um, because it's very good, but also big enough that a paperback trade trade paperbacks don't hold up well once they're more than like seven issues or so in my yeah. experience. Um, so it's on Hoopla, folks. I just Go and get her. it. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I I was saying this before we started recording, but I had like a big two week gap where I just didn't read comics, which was like the first time that's happened in probably five or more years where i just didn't read any like western comics for 
two weeks. It's strange. I read some manga while I was traveling. Like, I was catching up on Dragon Ball and reading My Hero Academia and One Punch Man and stuff. But um, it's I, I, I didn't track it in my little logger. I have this logger, like, spreadsheet that tracks all my comics that I read. Nerd. Um, I, oh I'm a huge nerd. God. You're <laughs> huge such nerd. a nerd. Well, I mean, I, I did it at first to make sure that I was, like, keeping track of everything that I was reading. But then yeah. I realized, oh, at the end of the year, I can actually break this down and see how many comics I read versus graphic novels versus manga. Um, and I, I haven't been keeping track of the chapters because I don't need to because the, the Shonen Jump app is actually really good about keeping track of where you were reading on yep. the specific device that you were using. So, um, but either way, I haven't read a lot, but I did, like, get home from the wedding and then, like, sat down and read uh, West Coast Avengers number one through four. Uh, this is Kelly Thomas. Thompson and Stefano Caselli, and I've been sitting on these issues for a while, uh, given that this book only ran for 10 issues, I picked them all up um, on a Marvel sale, and but I, I actually wanted to sit down and read it, and so I got four issues in, which I don't think is the end of the first arc, but I'm getting into it, and it's a little slow and strange, it's very wordy, um, which I feel kind of strange about, because um, Kelly Thompson, to me, isn't really someone that it gets super wordy, but I feel like she does better in like solo or pair titles, specifically her uh, Gambit and Rogue series that she did, or Mr. and Mrs. X series, um, and then the Rogue and Gambit series, I should say. Um, like those books weren't super wordy, but she didn't really need to convey a lot because those characters had chemistry. And whereas this West Coast Avengers team is made up of a whole mishmash of characters. Um, you know, we've got Kate Bishop, we've got Clint Barton, we've got Quentin Choir, Gwenpool, uh, Miss America, and Kate. Kate's boyfriend, um, whose name is escaping me, and now I feel terrible because he's a cool character. He's just like a new superhero, and it's it's really fun. Um, it's a really hilarious book. Like she's definitely taking the piss out of a lot of stuff in comics, which I, I really enjoy. She's always done a very good job of that as a writer. Um, and I think like in three to five years, people are going to be writing articles like, "Remember when Hawkeye's old boyfriend did this? Remember mm-hmm. when Quentin Quire kissed this kissed this little known Marvel character named Gwenpool?" Um, people are going to be talking about that stuff in like f- three to five or ten years. You know, like remember this stuff because we see that stuff now with like maybe old teen titans books or we see it with old new x-men academy x stuff like remember this little known character that's coming back in jonathan hickman's resurgence of the (laughs) x-men you know um, in that, exactly that voice. It's never yeah, said I, not in that voice. <laughs> I, I also want to take this time to talk that I'm uh, I want I'm going to start a YouTube channel. Um, it's just going to be me doing that. Uh, no, but still, like <laughs> I think I think West Coast Avengers is a beautiful book. Stefano Caselli deserves some awards for drawing just some damn good superheroes. And Kelly Thompson, I think, really embraces the Matt Fraction esque Hawkeye, where Kate and Clint have these attitudes of just being kind of tired and like dead all the time like they just have no energy but they know they have to do this shit and they're like god damn it i have to save the world again i don't really know if i can do this um which i really enjoy but it is a little wordy so it takes a bit of time to read through the book um Really quick, I also read Powers of X number four and House of X number five. I really don't have anything to say about these without spoiling them, um, but the train keeps running and I'm ready for it to crash land my brain <laughs> into a giant brick wall at the end of this series. Um, I and finally, these... oh sorry, well, go I, ahead. Go I was ahead. gonna say I need these Hox Pox books to come out in trade format because no one will shut up about them. But yeah, I'm trade, yeah. I'm a trade waiter now, so I'm just like, come on, Marvel, make this happen. Yeah, you're gonna have to take like a week off of work. Um, <laughs> to read these, it, it's serious business. I mean, I I think it's it's really good, but it is serious business. Um, and then you're gonna have to go read that stuff that I think Xavier Files was doing for a while, and now got picked up by Polygon called Hox Pox Talks, where they break down every single issue. And they talk about all the references and all the callbacks and all the stuff that Hickman's doing to build this new universe using existing lore and stuff that he came up with specifically for this series. Um, I haven't read any of it, but I've only been told that you must read it, so I haven't read it. Uh, (laughs) uh, I, I need to eventually go back and do that. I just... I only got so much time in the day. But anyways, one final thing I want to talk about before we move into comics we're excited for... I got an advanced copy of the plot number one. This is from Vault Comics, uh, written by Tim Daniel and Michael Morisi, uh, with art by Joshua Hickson, colors by Jordan Boyd, and letters by Jim Campbell. And 
I'm terrified after reading this book. There is something so creepy and spooky about the story here where there's um, mystery and horror and unanswered questions. Uh, I definitely need to know what the hell is going on, but I'm also really scared to know what's going on. Um, There's murder, supernatural stuff. There's an old house, a broken family, bad blood in an old time, in an old town. And to kick it all off, Joshua Hickson and Jordan Boyd put together some pages that are just bone chilling. Um, The end of this issue has a single half page panel that is gorgeous and terrifying all at once um it's unbelievable the amount of range that this this pair of uh joshua hickson and jordan boyd are able to get in terms of dynamic color with such a muted color palette it's all blues and greens and browns but everything is just toned down and it's really really dark adding this overall like super creepy feeling to the whole book um you get some like really dark yellows in there to add light in quotes to the story but it all just feels like it's very horror it's very dark and it feels it reminds me of um like brubaker and phillips's incognito or sleeper but with more muted to- muted tones like brubaker and phillips on both incognito and sleeper used a really limited color palette in order to evoke this kind of noir feeling in those stories whereas uh, Jordan Boyd and Joshua Hickson are using it to create a really creepy horror element. Um, I don't know if you guys read uh, Harrow County, but it's, yeah. it's similar in color sc- style like that, where there's just a lot of dark colors going on. You are um, selling me on this book so hard. You are yeah. saying all the keywords that I want to hear for my October get out, gotta get spooky comics yeah, reading. This- this is a perfect book, I think, to lead into that spooky horror side of fall. And I'm really excited to see where this book goes. The plot number one, it comes out this Wednesday. So if you can get it from your shop or you can pick it up on Comixology or whatever, um, it's definitely a book I'd recommend. Uh, I, I just love Mar- Maurice's writing in general. And I've, I've never read anything by Tim Daniel that I can think of. I'm sure that I have. I'm just not coming to mind. But uh, they did a great job as building a broken family and some really bad shit happening to them. And we still don't know what actually is going on so i'm i'm super digging it but let's talk about comics that are coming out this upcoming week comics are dropping on september 25th 2019 what are you both excited for this week let's start with you kara so okay moon girl and devil dinosaur number 47 the solicit says like reed richards meets his match and i'm like oh right the fantastic four are a thing (laughs) (laughs) they've been gone for so long and, you know, the majority of my frame of reference for Fantastic Four is the movies from the mid 2000s. So I'm just I'm just picturing that. But now with Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur thrown in and I need that movie <laughs> like so badly. Um, there's a new Star Wars comic that's out this week called Star Wars Resistance Kylo Ren number one. <laughs> oh boy! I just had such a visceral reaction to seeing that he was getting his own book. And so... <laughs> My notes say, look, he's a trash baby. We must love him to fix him. That's how that works, right? No, it is not. Ray, run away. <laughs> like, right now. <laughs> like, I just have so many thoughts. Like, like all the people who ship Kylo Ren and Ray, like, I get it. It's super tempting. But we, like, kind of already did that with Anakin and Padme, and that ended horribly. So what if we don't do that? Like, we've already sort of explored this to some extent with Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade and, like, the Star Wars legacy stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. it's fine. We can move on. Let's just let Rey hang out with her boyfriend and his husband, Rey and and Poe and Finn, all together. Right? 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 That's where this is going, right? The thing that got me when I saw this uh, solicitation was, like, wait a minute. Has there not been a Kylo Ren title yet? There has not. No. What? So now there is. That is shocking mm-hmm. to me. Right? And then the other book I wanted to quickly shout out because uh, the description sounds amazing is there's a new Ether series from Dark Horse. And Mike informs me that this is actually one, uh, just the latest incarnation of this series. This is part three of a, quote, fantasy adventure that Sherlock Holmes meets Dr. Seuss. And so, like, right there, you have me on multiple levels, but also mm-hmm. the creative team is Matt Kint and David Rubb. And if you're at all familiar with Matt Kint's work on mind management, you should be very excited for this kind of book. So, oh, yeah, I'm just I am. I am hype. I am hype, but yeah. mostly because there are already stories that I can read from this series. Mm-hmm. So, yes. And that's me. That's what yeah, I'm hyped it- for. 
Yeah, Kara, I think you're really going to enjoy those first two volumes if you get your hands on them. They're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Kate, what about you? What are you excited for this week? I am pumped for another one of Vault's new comics um, called Relics of Youth. It has the number one issue coming out this week. It's written by Chad Reibman and Matt Nicholas with art by Skylar Skylar Patridge. And it's being uh, solicited as like a blend of fantasy and adventure with a little mystery and mythology mixed in, which is like, can you be any more up my alley? The answer is yes. <laughs> you can put a pirate on the cover. Here we go, folks. This is happening. So the main character is a teenage girl who keeps dreaming of this unmapped island and the dreams are like becoming waking visions and she finds six other teenagers around the world who are like having the same kind of thing. They all wake up with these mysterious tattoos that only they can see and now they have to find this island and this it sounds to me a lot like um like kind of like lost and because it's very like we're going to the bermuda triangle and we're solving this mystery of this island um but with pirates question mark so um, i'm on i'm on board for this cool yeah, I was going to pick this book, and then I realized that Kate <laughs> already had it. So yeah, You uh, tried to pick this book, and I shut that down. Yeah, no, no, I it's true. I called Dixie's last night. <laughs> no, and it looks really good. I think, you know, this is just more proof that if you're not reading Vault Comics, you're making a mistake. you got to try some of this stuff. Honestly, I went on it's their so actual good. publisher's website looking for images to uh, of this comic to throw on this document, and saw all the stuff that they have going right now on their they actually have a really nice web page as opposed to some publishers <laughs> dc um <laughs> and yeah they have so much cool stuff going right now i could th- i could throw so much money at it if only i had money but right. <laughs> details yeah yeah well for me this week i'm excited for not only the plot number one from vault comics which i already talked about but the White Trees number two. This is Chip Zdarsky and Chris Anka. Their little two issue mini series that they're doing, and I, I just want to say I didn't know that Chip Zdarsky had it in him to make me feel a lot of fantasy feelings in one single issue. Like in issue number one, my heart was broken five times over, and it was also really, really turned on at the same time because there's so much like grief and sex and just massive world building done in one single issue that I'm like, how is it possible they're only doing two issues of this? Um, And I can't believe that it all ends this month, if I'm not mistaken. It's just two issues. I am so excited to see where they go. Um, Chris Anka, he's so good at drawing dudes looking hot. Uh, (laughs) I I like, when I'm reading this book, I like have to fan myself the entire time. And, And it's not just like hot, svelte looking dudes. It's like dudes of all body types and men and women and beyond um all these people look attractive whether they're overweight or they're skinny or they're super built like everybody looks really really good i don't know how he does it but it is a master like level of craft to see just what he does in the white trees number one um i'm definitely gonna buy whatever collected edition comes out of this because i want to physically own this book it's so beautiful it's got so much cool fantasy lore in it i'm very excited for the second issue i don't know where it's gonna go they've got to go rescue the people and do all the things but um you know standard fantasy stuff but i'm really interested to see what other weird interesting smart fantasy things they do on top of the main story so it's gonna be a lot of fun so can i dive in and ask a quick tangent question Based on what you just said, Mike, because you're yeah. talking about like a, like everyone looks so attractive. And I was just flashing back to this moment that I was reading a comic and saw a character and I was like, hot. So my question <laughs> for you and Kate is like when you think of like hot, like a moment when you were reading a comic and you looked at a character and you were like, hot, which like what book was it? What character was it? Because I have a very definitive answer for myself. <laughs> Recent, recently or like... All time. Overall. Uh, All time hat. <laughs> I mean, I feel... I, I feel weird commenting on like the way that women look in comics because I feel like it's shitty. So I don't want to like... <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I need understand to know the, now, Mike. The <laughs> well, no, because like, I... I don't know. I can't. I none of that stuff sticks in my head, right? Um, the thing that always sticks in my head um, is when 
men are drawn really well because I have like a uh like I I don't like the way that I look, but I like the way that these men look. And so I'm like if only I could look like that. So oh. I I a lot of those things stick in my head. I mean, and I don't feel so bad about myself that I like whatever but um still i realize that i'm not in shape and i want to be in shape like those dudes so those those types of things stick out in my head like recently chase stein in the runaway series he's 21 so it's okay um (laughs) chris anka and uh the artist that followed up uh chris's like art in that series holy shit beautiful beautiful specimen of a human being human male at least to me like that's to me i'm like holy cow that's really hot um but i don't know i i don't I don't think of like remember women characters in books like that because I I feel scummy to do that. Um, you know what? That's, that's fine. me. That's fine, Kate. I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean like in reading Mister Miracle, the way Mitch draws uh, draws Big Barda is very realistic. Okay. Like he actually yeah. draws a female the way that a female looks when a female is in shape and not a, a not like a twig and not weird proportions or anything like that like it just does a really nice job and you're like damn okay (laughs) yeah i can see that actually sorry i'm looking over my comics i'm like is there any book that i'm just like oh that's a good um so (laughs) this is goofy and i don't want to go any deeper than just me saying it but uh esther from uh (laughs) from giant days uh i got a whole i got a whole thing like for that that's that's me (laughs) oh mike that's so sweet yeah, no, she's a cutie. No, my my like hat moment is I was reading. Oh God, this was like probably a decade ago now when DC was doing their Titans series, where it was like the Wolfman Perez lineup of Teen Titans, but now they're grown ups, and so let's do the Titans series. And mm-hmm. there's this one panel of Wally West, the Flash, where he's like not in costume, but I think he was like trying to like warn somebody that he used to love that something like bad was coming so he had to get to their house super quick but couldn't let them know that it was him so he there's like this panel of him like perched in their window looking super intense and you can see his like green flashing eyes and his like ginger hair being windswept and stuff because he just ran Mm -hmm. super fast and he's got like a bandana covering the lower half of his face which is so dumb because i'm like wally if anyone knows you, they're going to look at your eyes and look at that hair and be like, yeah, oh, exactly. what are you doing? That's Wally West. <laughs> but like, I don't know what it was about this picture, but I just like it's burned in my mind as being like the most attractive a comic book character has ever been for me. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, this is a whole different topic in itself. Um, we're uh, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about school <laughs> and back to school stuff. <laughs> nice and wholesome. <laughs> yeah, nice and wholesome. So we'll be back in a second. For our show this week, we are talking about comics that have to do with school. I mean, a lot of people have been in school for maybe a month or so. People are back to college. People are back to high school, middle school, elementary school. And, you know, when we were thinking about it, there are a lot of comics that have to do with school. People in school, people that run schools. So we wanted to go through some of the comics that came to mind when we were thinking of school in comics and talk about why that idea works. I mean, it's very prevalent in prose, in movies, but does it work really well in comics? That's the question. I know Kate and Kara, you guys have some ideas. Why don't we just dive into some of the stuff that Kate has to, to, to get things going? The very first thing that comes to mind for me, because I... Being in grad school, think of college when I think of school, and the very first one, obviously, with that is giant days, giant days, giant days for days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, giant days to me is like one of the the first comics that I've read that's really about kids going to college. Yeah. Um, I I don't really know of many others. I'm sure I've missed some or maybe I forget, but like, yeah. Giant Days is the perfect comic when you're thinking about starting school as a freshman and being really excited versus starting school and being a freshman in high school when you're like a damaged garbage person, whereas at least you've had four years of high school (laughs) before you go to college, right? Or is that just me when I went to high school? (laughs) Are you okay? 
Yeah, yeah no. I, I was a dummy as a freshman going into high school. Um, because I thought, a rough age. Yeah, four, 13, 14, 15, you know, those are, those are tough years for, at least in the West, you know, here in the United States. That's the age that people go to high school and stuff. And I know it's a little bit different in the UK and elsewhere. Um, the ages of when you start the quote unquote high school phase of your, your academic career. But, uh, Giant Days to me, ooh solid book I, I guess kate what do you really dig about this book when it comes to the school aspect of things that it more so than i think any other comic i've read it feels a lot more accurate so many times when you get uh school-aged people in any type of storytelling the school it's like yeah we're technically in school but we're never ever going to see or hear about this person going to class or having <laughs> classwork yeah. uh, you know that or kind of Riverdale. thing Riverdale. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's like such a non part of their lives where when you're actually in school, it's a huge part of your life. Um, I I don't know about you guys, but like doing homework took up an extremely large part of my time and going to class and um, where you see them actually struggling with professors who aren't great and with how to manage their time in addition to all the normal coming of age kind of struggles. Um, so I think in that sense, it felt a lot more true to me. And I also just fell in love with the characters themselves, which I know we've gone gone on and on at length about on this show. So it does not need mm-hmm. to be said again. If you haven't read this book, again, Hoopla is your friend. <laughs> Yeah, and a large chunk of it is also on Comicsology Limited. I only plugged that because I realized that that's something. Because you're that a shill for Bezos. What? Well, no, yeah, I, I know. I, I think it's it's a it's a it works. It's a really good service to like get a taste of things. It, yeah. But um, still, I Giant Days. I think Kate, you brought up the point that I really liked a lot about this series is like there are struggles through the book where they're like, well, do I take this class? Mm-hmm. Well, does it? We the three of us want to take a class together. Can we all make it work? And of course, you don't ever do that with your friends as no. far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Every time I've tried to coordinate like a class with friends that are in like the same major or whatever, even like an extracurricular thing um, that's like a, an elective class or something, at least at my university we had those, it never works out because you find out either your friends are much better at school than you or much worse at school than you. And one way or another you end up depending on each other in a way that's to me not healthy for a friendship (laughs) yeah group projects ruin friendships i don't think i ever attempted to coordinate my schedule with friends and that may be that most of them were science majors like i like most of the people in my sorority were in biochem and i was over there like i'm doing international relations let's talk about (laughs) geopolitics and they were like would you like to bond to this chemical for me and i was like that that's math go away (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i got you i mean but yeah that, that's an interesting like aspect of this series and it's not like the primal focus it's not like there's a whole you know issue dedicated to them just sitting around picking their glasses but it is something that comes up like you can't really go in a story arc with that without them talking at some like aspect about going to school or dealing with a professor or dealing with a project or something like that. And I think that's what grounds the book in a lot of ways. It's not just the wacky adventures of these three girls in college. Right. It's it's they're actually going to school and they're also having wacky adventures, which I, I really appreciate. The the other thing that I really appreciate about Giant Days is it's much more grounded in the sense that like they're in the dorms and they have a set amount of stuff. They don't have inexplicable amounts of money or incredible right. like houses and Stuff like that. a little poor. They talk about money all the time. Which is (laughs) very realistic. Oh, yeah. Like what jobs that they're getting to pay the rent, what the realistic kind of house that they can get Mm -hmm. is. I identified very strongly with the character Ed when he moved into a new house and ended up in a room that was about the size of a closet. Mm -hmm. Because that was my situation for a while. But I, like Ed, had chosen that so that my friends whom I loved could have the bigger rooms. So, because Ed and I are martyrs of kindness and want no (laughs) praise for it whatsoever. Just the knowledge that we've done good in this world. (laughs) Oh, boy. All right. Next week, we're doing an episode all about how amazing Kara is. Um. (laughs) I'm sorry. I thought that's what every episode was about. Oh, snap. (laughs) Is this where I Um, flip my hair? (laughs) Yeah, but but beyond, I mean, beyond Giant Days, again, we've we've talked about this show at length, or talked about this book at length on the show. So, I mean, beyond that, I mean, another thing that I could think of is just all of the manga 
all the manga all the time, like a lot of shonen manga. Uh, I think a lot of shoujo manga also like focuses a lot on going to school and the interactions and maybe some interplay about school before they get into the you know super magical girl thing or they get into oh yeah you're actually you have the soul of an undead god inside your body and now you have to go fight these demons. You know before all that <laughs> stuff starts, it usually has the premise of we go to school together and and then the story continues right. Um, but that's such a focus, it's such a focal part of starting a lot of these stories. One of the very first manga I ever read when uh, when I was young and naive and mm-hmm. someone passed me their copy of a manga was about this high school. So it's called Strawberry Panic. And it's about this high school for girls that is, I think, a Catholic high school or you're made to think it's a Catholic high school or at least from a Western standpoint reads as a Catholic high school like it's all the school uniforms and the various things. But I could be remembering it correctly. It has been several years. Um, But the premise of this manga is that it's an all-girls school and they have a competition every year about who's the best couple. But it is a non-romantic couple. It's, you know, a a just friends couple, wink, wink. And about these girls trying to win this best couple thing but it's definitely all uh it was so weird and i was like i'm sorry what is this and why did you give it to me and it's an omnibus so you think to yourself well at the very least i'm gonna find out who's best couple because i've not really become invested in this if we're being honest with ourselves but like Mm -hmm. you're gonna find out right But apparently the series got canceled, and so you never actually find out who's the best couple, and then you're irrationally mad about it because you didn't care, but now you care? You're like, fuck you. Wow, I've I've never heard of this series. you throw this book back at the person who lent it to you and go, I don't know if we should be friends anymore. Were they actual lesbians, or was it just... No, in the book, it's the book, I think maybe because of ratings or something, or it's older, I don't know. But in, in the book, it's all like... We're just friends, but we're going to be the cutest, best couple. But they're like all the different stereotypes of relationships. It's very strange. My high school bestie and I would have crushed that competition. We would have absolutely (laughs) won best couple. Well, and there's like all these like, oh, this senior girl with this freshman and she's so like male stereotype and she's so female stereotype. Like it's, yeah. It sounds strange. It was very weird. I, I understand your anger. (laughs) <laughs> right yeah yeah i mean the the manga that i was i was thinking of was like a bleach like bleach for example you know starts in high school you know uh, ichigo is going to school and, and then he finds out that he has like this ability to see demons and the school aspect goes away pretty quickly in that book but it always oh. starts there you know he knows all of his friends that also somehow have powers they all go to the same school like you. i mean that's a that's a it's chunk because of the book. there's lead in the drinking fountains of that school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Is that MSU what you just, just sent about? out? Well, I've never known that this is what Bleach is about. <laughs> so Bleach, I mean, <laughs> Bleach is, it's, it's an interesting book. It went in a lot of different directions. But yeah, Ichigo, our main character, has the ability to see these demons um, or ghosts in this city. And then eventually someone realizes, oh, he can see this. And he ends up meeting what's called a soul reaper. And she's like, whoa, you can see me? He's like, yeah, I've been able to do this my whole life. Shut up. And <laughs> she's like, that's rude. And then they get in a fight. And he, she's like, okay, well, eventually you're just going to come to the soul society with me where people die and go to there i guess if their souls are good i'm remembering this awfully it's been years <laughs> um and they're like you know what? we're gonna make you an honorary soul reaper because you know what you can summon this humongous blade out of your body and that means that you have some sort of special power and then it turns out he's like this chosen one because he also has like half demon in his body because of the way that he died or his mom died or something it's mm-hmm. it go it gets way away from school pretty quick okay. but it does start off with all of his friends you know orihime and Chad and uh, I can't remember the guy with the glasses. They all go to the same school and they're friends, and it's it's bizarre. And they all have different powers because the, the book is insane. It's fucking insane. Okay, but so it starts in school. So manga that do take place in school. Mike had this on his list, but I'm gonna go ahead and snipe it. Is Oran yeah. High School Host Club? Yeah, which yeah, is yeah, fit, the most I, ridiculous I, manga, and I love it so much. But um, and I. I do also like the anime. I actually saw the anime first. But the premise of Oran High School Host Club is that 
this girl named Haruhi is on like academic scholarship to this elite academy that she could never possibly afford to go to without this scholarship. And she ends up in the rooms of this like host club and almost immediately breaks a pretty priceless vase. So they're like, well, you broke the vase. Can you pay like the millions of dollars that it's worth? And she's like, no. And they're like, great. You're our indentured servant. <laughs> and her hair is cut. That short, happened so to they... me in high school too. <laughs> I was literally like, immediately an indentured servant. I was like, shit. <laughs> Hashtag relatable. So, so Har- <laughs> Har- he has like really short hair and kind of a boyish figure. So they all assume she's a boy. So they loop her into this host club where basically they're like providing a dating experience basically they're male escorts without the sex and for high school students and their they're- children <laughs> so right so they're they're these like rich boys in this elite school who have this host club which is them giving all these like themed parties to the rich ladies who pay them richly for the privilege so Har he's roped in as an indentured servant slash host and so like slowly the boys in the club realize that she's a girl and shenanigans ensue because of course some of them get crushes on her and Mm -hmm. she has like moments with each of them where you're like "Ooh, will she end up with this one Ooh, will she end up with that one it doesn't really matter because she's like the anti-heroine almost like the the creator of this series was very kind of poking fun at all these stereotypes in all mm-hmm. these shoujo manga of like how the girl is supposed to act because Haruhi does none of those things. She's like completely oblivious to everything that's happening around her. She's not impressed by all this fancy shit. And she kind of like sees right to the core of everyone while still being oblivious about herself. So she says all these like devastating one liners to all these poor boys who just want her to love them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just it's such a joy to read it's so dumb it's so ridiculous but i love it so much and that like that's a book that very much takes place in school like sometimes the gang goes on like all these extravagant vacations or something but it all comes back to this fancy ass academy where everyone right. has way too much money and doesn't know what to do with it so they have like tropical tea parties in the middle of the winter <laughs> <laughs> right because why not i mean th- th- that makes me think of my hero academia i don't need to I feel like I don't need to explain my hair academia, but it's, you know, people with quirks go to essentially an X-Men style school and, you know, learn to hone their skills at eventually becoming heroes because it's an academy to train people to eventually become heroes. Um, and yeah, it, it always finds a way to circle back to the school in some capacity, you know. In in later chapters, they end up in like their own dorm style thing because it's too dangerous for these kids to like leave the school and go back and forth in their homes. So like, we're just gonna set you all up with apartments. So there's like four chapters of them decorating their little apartments or their whatever Aww. that they're living in. It's it's actually really adorable, and I know that there are fans out there who hated it. I thought it was a really cool way to like show off some of these side characters that we definitely want to see more stories about, but we won't get to until much later in the story. And so they all got their own little bit where they got to show their apartment off based on their, you know, personality, which I think is a like kind of a trope in in some manga. But uh, I really, in, I really enjoyed it <laughs> reading it there. But it always comes back to them like they're still in school, they're still training, they're not official heroes. Um, but now it's leaning more towards oh, now they're getting internships to work under heroes to do some training. Um, but it's still all like oriented around them being in school. Um, but since I mentioned it, we got to bring up the big one, X Men. Right. Yeah. yeah. How much like of X Men actually? One, honestly, like how much of it actually takes place in school, though? Like I feel like in the movies depends they at the least run. have that as home base. Yeah, it, yeah. It really depends on the run. Um, like for instance, some of the ones I listed, like New X Men, takes place strictly at um the Xavier School. Um, Grant Morrison's New X Men run is all about them being at school, and there are stuff. Th- there is a lot of stuff that happens outside the school, like the you know decimation of Genosha, and there's some bigger events that happen with um Charles Xavier and Jean Grey, but like. There is an entire arc that's just about Quentin Quire leading this a- exodus against the Xavier School because he thinks that Magneto is right. And so there's a whole thing about how do the teachers manage, manage this. Some people get brought back to be teachers. And that seems to be like a common theme. Like, for instance, Bobby Drake, um, later in Cena Grace's run of Iceman, he, he, at the end of the series, he kind of comes back to be a teacher. And he's like, okay, I want to help these kids. Um, and, and then immediately says, I can't help these kids. <laughs> Like Aww. in the following series, which is really funny. Um, but something like New X-Men Academy X, which I know, Kate, you listed this as well. Mm-hmm. That's a series all about the students at the school. And they're in school all the time. Uh, and they're kind of doing like Harry Potter-esque hijinks. But of course, death is on the line constantly, unlike Harry Potter, where, eh, you know, death's out there. But NBD. Only uh, in June, Mike. <laughs> only in the month of June. 
Yes, only in the May. month of June. Only in the months uh, of May or June does Harry actually co- like come up against death. <laughs> right, exactly. Where I mean, I think New X-Men Academy X has a lot of stuff about them exploring the school and being in class, and they all get broken up into different teams to do training and stuff, which creates like a, a rivalry between some groups, um, specifically the Hellions being the worst of that group, um, despite me loving, uh, what's his name, who is aka Hell- hellion his team is amazing dust and and mercury and uh rock slide oh my gosh some characters that are still in my heart i'm so happy that they still exist in the x-men universe um all spawned from x-men academy x which was a spin-off of uh new x-men by grant morrison they took some of those characters and ran them um further in the story of them being students uh but kate i want to hear what you thought about that because my x-men world is a whole different thing but i mean you read this and i know you actually like this book right all new x-men or not all new X-Men, but new X-Men Academy X. Oh, did I write that, Mike? Oh, you mentioned all new X-Men. Oh, boy. I'm thinking of a totally different book then. All so new X-Men. much X-Men. All new X-Men. So that's the the one from way back where the time-traveling core team like gets brought into yes. the present. And, yes. Yes. Um, I, that one, I really like that one. I only read a few volumes until it did a crossover, and then I fell off the wagon uh, just right. because I couldn't find that particular graphic novel. And then... You know, um, yeah, I don't know. Like the, the thing that gets with the X Men. So I came to X Men first in the movies, like the uh, what was it, er, late nineties, early two thousands, when we got first the first X Men movie. Oh yeah, yeah, um, oh, yeah. And that whole thing of like, are you a teenager who feels out of place and different? Welcome to Xavier's Academy for cool people like you. And yeah. then you go on cool adventures and there's all these cool older people who are like there doing cool things. And totally I don't know. not creepy. It's totally <laughs> not creepy in any way whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> um, <but> <laughs> that we anyway. leave that for the Jedi. Yeah. So I, <laughs> there's so many younglings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't know. When I read the X-Men comics, I love when it gets back to that the theme of like there's all these different kids that are trying to make it and trying to make it together. And they're all very different from one another and yet the same in their differentness, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And then also having like the cool battles. But that outsider theme, I think, really resonated with me as a uh, not out gay kid going to a high school in a super conservative area and Mm -hmm. you know that whole thing and i think that's why for me the x-men they just have some of the coolest powers some of the coolest weirdest powers are those x kids that don't get a lot of airtime yeah yeah so i think that's why it was right up there for me no i mean all sorry i i totally misread what you wrote like you wrote x-men academy um and i just assumed it was academy x is a different thing but like the x-men academy in general like that post that post Grant Morrison New X Men um really had a lot of books about the focus on an Xavier school. Um Josh Whedon's Astonishing X Men was an example, X Men Academy X. Um I think th- those are good examples. I know there was eventually like a the Wolverine and the X Men series that came out of the spin off of Schism, where the Uncanny X Men series became about uh Cyclops basically going out and finding mutants and training them to be part of his kind of military like army thing that he was doing and meanwhile Wolverine was like no fuck that these kids need to just learn and so he you know started the Jean Grey school of higher learning he renamed the Xavier school and there the whole book is about all these kids trying to like survive and all this bad shit happens to them of course because it's the X-Men but they are all in school throughout that book which I, I think is really interesting we also get Wolverine dressed up as a clown and so if you want that in your life Ew. that exists as a book no. Um, and I know that they also did a series. I never read it, and I kind of am bummed about it. But uh, Spider Man and the X Men, um, if I'm not mistaken, that was the name of it. And he, Peter Parker, essentially goes to the Jean Grey school and is a teacher. What? <laughs> and so I think it's it's like the hijinks of what if Spider Man was your teacher, um, as well as I'm sure some adventures and wacky things that happen. That's so cute. Yeah, it's it's really fun stuff. But beyond the X Men, I know you know Kate. You've got some other books listed. I know Kara. You have the Ultimate School book. So I mean, which one do we want to jump into next? Archie, like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to be so obvious about it, but the Archie comics are all like almost all of them take place at Riverdale High, and it's just like it's so central to the core of what that book is because like the whole tagline that they used for decades was that Archie is America's typical teenager Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. 
all like basically all their adventures revolve around like who's dating who and what sport are you playing and like our little garage band is going to go out to play this gig and it's just very like here we are in school in suburbia and here are our adventures a uh, notable exception to that is Josie and the Pussycats because I went through like a moment where I was really genuinely confused about if Josie and her friends actually went to school or not because like they're teenagers and they're in a band but you only ever see Josie and the Pussycats on the road I think there's like one issue that I can remember where they're at school and it's one where like Melody ends up wearing a dress that's just made out of dollar bills for some reason but <laughs> sure, like this sure. is the one time I can remember them actually being in a school setting so I think with the Josie and the Pussycats reboot from a couple years ago they were really smart to just kind of bypass all of that and make the girls like post college age so they wouldn't have to explain why these girls are just not in school ever <laughs> right right <laughs> but yeah like the Archie gang is in school um sabrina is usually in school or in magical school depending on which series you're reading like there is a sabrina manga from the early 2000s where she it, like the whole premise was her going to this like magical academy in the other realms so that would be cool i would read that oh, yeah. one yeah. yeah yeah it's very early 2000s magic school is one of my favorite things in media like harry potter and everything like it, whether it's the Jedi Academy books or all that stuff. Like, I, it is a favorite theme that I have had since I was young, and I am not ashamed to say I still have it. Oh, my yeah. God. I remember the Jedi Academy books. Those things were awesome. That was, like, they the first time incredible. I realized. Yeah, that was, like, the first time I realized there was more to Star Wars than just the movies. I was like, there's more, and it's written for people my age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's more women in it. This is what? fantastic. Crazy. You know, to, to bring up something that's not necessarily like a big two book, actually, now that I think about it, there is a book, Superhero or Super Mutant Magic Academy, that uh, Jillian Tamaki made. It was like a web series that got bound together and has like a summarizing story that is all about these kids that have superpowers or mutant powers or they have magical abilities and they all go to the same school and it's kind of like a mishmash of you know harry potter and uh x-men and any other kind of like school setting and these kids just kind of coexist and it's a real like fun goofy web series that has a very touching end um where it all rounds off on the big dance because you know we got to play into these school tropes like crazy and that's a wonderful little standalone book that is just about a handful of characters existing in this school setting. And sometimes they're talking about school. Sometimes they're at the cafeteria. Sometimes they're, you know, outside of school going to like a movie. Um, or in the case of the end, they're going to the big school dance. Um, I would really recommend that one if you want something that's off the beaten path. Um, that's also a school oriented book because that one is, ooh, stupendous and hilarious from beginning to end. Um, I really recommend that one. Just to that just to throw that in. Cool. I would also another like off the beaten path one that I'd recommend is Misadra by hmm, I'm gonna butcher this. Ayazmin Omar Ada. It's a OGN um, about an individual going to and I, I believe it's a memoir, a graphic memoir. Um I know the author himself has has the issue because it's about going to college when you have epilepsy. And it's the best depiction I've read so far of going to school while managing a like serious chronic illness and oh, the struggle to try and balance the normal tasks of that age of like figuring out how to run your own life and how to, you know, who you are and how to make friends and how to manage classes and social life and balance all those things in addition to how to also manage your illness on the first time by your own on your own like separate from parents telling you to take your meds and stuff like that and how to balance the needs of uh taking care of your health with t um taking care of classwork and taking having social interactions and how to how those struggles kind of come into play with roommates and trying to feel like you fit in when you really are different and stuff like that. It was very good and goes also into the kind of depression and anxiety that can spring from that in a very realistic way with also incredible art. The the way the artist depicts, um, which this is all the one person doing the writing and art, the, the depictions of the seizures themselves are so beautiful and so, like, done in a very interesting way that I thought worked very well. Um, that is going to be tough to describe, but when you see it, you'll go, oh, wow, yeah. 
but um oh yeah i've I've seen the cover for this book, yeah. Yeah. Just just showing showing the slipping into seizures via art versus via words, I think works extremely well in that the art the art is changing, the line work is changing, the colors change, and you see that kind of slip into it and then trying to come out of it and that disorientation that the person is feeling uh when they first come out of a seizure of not knowing what happened and all that stuff and um mm-hmm. then yeah, it was it was very good. I definitely definitely would recommend it, especially if you are have ever had struggles like that yourself. It is very um, validating in the sense that it's like reading someone else with a similar experience, which you don't usually get for that particular thing in comics. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember seeing the cover for this and not knowing what the book was about, but you you've sold me. You have straight up sold me, Kate. Yeah, it's the the only. Um, hesitation might be the price point it is a hardcover ogn so i got this one from the library uh like you do um yeah i don't know how about would you guys consider i kill giants a school comic yeah i think the the first half of that is it definitely is you know because a lot of the struggles you know that the main character faces happen in school to begin with right you know like she's arguing with her counselor Mm -hmm. and like she's she's acting out in school Um, I think it it breaks away from that narrative, but like similar to the manga stuff that I mentioned, like that doesn't necessarily disregard it, I think. I think I was thinking the same thing. And in the same way as Masadra, it's how how she school is interacting with the struggle that this character is going through. And um, and eventually school becomes very irrelevant. It's like an irrelevant distraction to her as she's, quote unquote, fighting giants and like no spoilers, because if you hadn't read this, like, why the hell not? You need to go do that immediately. Um, I agree. But that's like. I felt very, and again, very true. Where certain certain life issues start to uh, usurp the concerns of homework and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. In the vision, Viv and Vin going to school is a fairly central point, I think, in book two, <laughs> and them trying to <laughs> yeah. fit in with human kids and not doing so well. Um, and yeah, again, yeah, that's that like. Man, did I like inadvertently like every single one of my books is about being an outside weirdo fitting in? Okay. Yes. Maybe. I need to go count, talk to my therapist. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kate also has a personal brand. I do. Yeah. I don't yeah. know that I like it, but I do. <laughs> uh. Well, okay. So let, let me actually get to like the, I guess the higher level question here is before we wrap up the episode, you know, why does this work so well? in comics or do you think that this works really well in comics um in the same way that i think it works really well in prose and, and a lot of times movies you'll see a jillion disney made for tv movies that start with i'm just a kid and let me tell you about my mom here you know and like they'll they'll go into this thing or i'm going in my first day of school it's like Irrit? this is the bully and he doesn't like me you know that's that's the like i don't know thing that i think of in my head of like some kid doing a narration walking through school this is my best friend and this is the girl that hates me but i have a crush on her you know they'll they'll do that <laughs> they don't we don't get maybe that much in comic books i'm sure that i know there's a comic out there that does that where they like stop and they go this is me and this is the world that i live in um but d- does this work really well in comics for you guys do you think that this is like a, a a way to like start stories or if it does work really well why do you think that is I think it's because it's, again, not to discount people who are homeschooled and all stuff like that, but I think school is such a central experience of most people's life at that age that it works as a base platform where pretty most of your audience will be able to relate in some sense and have a sen- general sense of that person's um, background setting, I guess. Um, yeah, from a, from a world-building perspective, it's there are so many shortcuts yeah visually and atmospherically by using school as a setting because you assume that the majority of your readership has already experienced these things so you don't need to go into detail setting up the scene because once you're at a school most of your readership is going to know what that means already right when the bell rings it's For time sure. to go to class and like you, you were know, things s- like that and like you were saying, Mike, that instantly puts you in contact with other kids who can be your other characters. It's a it's yeah, becomes yeah. easy. You know, you meet on the train on your way to your magical castle school. <laughs> As one does. I tell you, I That's think how we, I met we all my friends. Do, 
we we genuinely need to do like a like a, a special one off where we just talk about Harry Potter. Like yes. it's not going to be on the main feed. Maybe we'll throw it up on Patreon and just do like an hour long discussion about Harry Potter because I'm here you guys, for that. I realized how important that goddamn book series is in my life, and it's all I can so think about. Good. Like I always am relating back to Harry Potter. But preach. Sorry, beyond that, beyond that. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I agree. I think that, that that point of, you know, this is like a, a baseline for a lot of people. What's interesting is that, is, is like reading something like Giant Days or reading something like any manga, right? Where the school system is different than maybe the Western, you know, school system that you went to. Or even, you know, and that can vary from state to state. You know, like maybe high school for you was only 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Because that's what it was for me. Because in 9th grade, I had there was a separate building I went to for, for high school. But in 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade, I went to the actual high school. You know, whereas most people are like, oh, 9th. Nine through twelve is this building, or you know, sixth and seventh grade were in this building, but eighth grade was at somewhere else. I mean, I think it varies from from area to area, but the commonality of you know, when the bell rings, it's time for class. People have lockers, yeah. or you ha- carry a big, huge backpack. I guess all of that is there to you know create a okay. You understand this baseline now. Let's build off of that. Um, just to iter- reiterate what you guys were already saying, um, I think the the thing that's that's really interesting about it is that uh the the varying just small changes kind of what i was talking about between books and uh to go back to what i was talking about with the like japanese school i don't understand how japanese high school middle school works at all even to this day having read all these books and yet i can see based on the book that i'm reading whether or not i think these kids are like 16 17 versus 14 15 because i think those are two different separate schools and uh, it's interesting to see the types of stories that are told based on those very small age, age ranges. Um, you'll get more mature stuff with the older stuff. For for instance, Kaki Giguri. I don't know if you guys or Kaki Giguri. I can't sp- sp- say it at all because I don't know how to speak anything. But it's a game. It's a it's a manga about a compulsive gambler, and it's like this crazy high end school where everybody's rich, and all they do is just gamble on anything possible mm. um those are definitely older kids like 16 17 18 um because there's a lot of very mature themes in that book and of course it's aimed at older readers but um you wouldn't tell that same story about like 13 14 15 year old kids because it's way too violent and undertone sexual things it's not a book for younger kids is all i'm saying mm. um but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I was going somewhere with that, and then I completely lost it. All I'm saying is that schools outside of the United States still are a mystery to me to this day because I'm an uncultured fool, and I do all I can to read as much of this stuff to try to understand it as possible. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess, I don't know. Do you guys have any other final thoughts about schools now that I've blabbered on for four minutes straight? Well, now that I work in a school, back to school like still has meaning for me in a way that it doesn't have... For people who don't work in schools, but we're very much affected by the rhythms of the school year and back to school is all about like, you know, you you see like the kids finding their way to their new classrooms and making new friends and maybe so and so is no longer friends with so and so even though they're attached to the hip and you think the teachers don't notice but we know. (laughs) <laughs> we know kids so I'm like like looking back at my own school experiences now that i work in a school i'm like mm, the teachers were definitely gossiping about us <laughs> and like <laughs> ooh, they definitely noticed that thing that time like one time uh one uh, one time one of my best friends and i got in a screaming match in the math hallway about taxation because we were nerds <laughs> and yeah. And one of the math teachers came out of the office to, like, stop us from... Because we were, like, red in the face screaming about the flat tax versus the progressive income tax. <laughs> and, oh, my God. Uh, right? So, I'm like, oh. Okay. So, looking back, I'm like, yeah, that that was definitely the topic of conversation for the rest of that week in that office. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As a teacher slips, like, a, a book about taxation into your library with a... With a like smiley face on in a sticky note yeah so like so so revisiting school through things like comics and books and television just like has a a a new perspective for me now as an adult but i think that even though we are adults and i think the majority of the listeners on our podcast are adults uh you can still appreciate these stories because odds are you went through a similar experience so you can emote with the characters or 
uh, say like, oh, I would have been friends with that character or oh, I would have hated that character. Or, oh, right, like, man, I right. would have had such a crush on that character. Like it, it kind of gives you a lens to revisit your own school days and how they affected you and gives you like a different framework through which to look at them. Definitely. What about you, Kate? Because academia for life, folks. Why not? Um, mm -hmm. There's reasons. There's reasons. Every, there's every reasons. industry has its drawbacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love... I think the atmosphere of it, the nostalgia of it, the um, kind of seeing your younger self in some of these characters more than I do when it's just a, group, a ragtag group of young adults. Um, mm -hmm. I think because my the vast majority of my life when i was there at that age when i was a ragtag group of young adults was consumed by school so i think i relate to it more heavily um than i do some of these other books and there's just a lot of good stories being told about it definitely definitely well i'm, I'm glad we got to go through some some really fun comics i think we we mentioned quite a bit i'll put all those in the show notes um some of these i actually need to read i feel like i need to check out Orin high school host club because you're not the first person to tell me to read it kara um, watch the watch the anime it's on netflix okay i'll check out the anime that's that's an easy sell that one was handed to me by the same person who gave me that strawberry panic book <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, I guess I'll take that uh, into into consideration <laughs> as I dive into it. Um, but I guess you know, let's uh, we can wrap up here. I would say you know, thank you guys for joining me on the show this week. You can follow us all on Twitter. You can follow Kara at Kzam or Kara S Zam. You can follow me at Mike Rappin, and you can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram at IRCB Podcast, where we try to post things. I post you know funny photos that Renee sends me on Snapchat sometimes, um, and and as much as I can. I don't know when I when I have time, I try to post as much as I can and schedule stuff and our twitter and instagram feeds you can subscribe to our patreon at patreon.com slash ircb podcast without your support this show wouldn't survive dun 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 join now for access to exclusive audio and articles early access to top of my pile posts and more we also have a fabulous goodreads group which is a lovely community of comic friends and we have weekly threads you can check it out at ircbpodcast.com slash goodreads you can also find us at ircbpodcast.com, where we have the show and also a pronunciation guide and some merch. Please remember to rate and review our show, and we'll read your review on an episode of it. We have over 200 episodes, so we should have 200 reviews. Mike, I don't know about your math there. <laughs> <laughs> Email at the least show. 200. <laughs> Email the show with what you've been reading, recipes, corrections, anything you want at ircbpodcast at gmail.com. I will say someone just sent me a name in an email and they said, fix this. And I didn't know what that meant. So if you're listening, I need some more context, whoever you are. <laughs> I really appreciate you asking us to put something on the pronunciation guide, but I need to know how the name is pronounced. So make sure to send that over to us. You can check out Infinity Shred. They are the best band in the universe. They do all the music for our show. Their new album is top notch music. So if you get a chance, check them out at infinityshred.com. Xander is a high wizard and a great friend. He gives the best hugs. He also edits the show. We can't thank him enough for his time and patience with us over the many years of the show i want to say thank you to kate and kara for being on the episode this week this has been a blast and i'm so glad to be back so until next time comics are good and so are you God. Sorry, not sorry. Kara. <laughs> I mean, don't ever apologize. Jesus. Oh, that's amazing. I that, it's but it is it is completely true. Like I I have like a I put a firm barrier in my head around like drawn characters. I don't ever feel like attracted to to folks. But like in but like it's 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 strange like the 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 look and the character of like esther de groot like that is totally something that 16 17 year old mike would like die for like that's the type of person that mike was super into um back when he was younger and that always sticks in my head and i'm like esther oh de what a character would have broken your heart and you know it she, you would have liked it <laughs> She would have buried me. I would have never recovered. That's um, like so. The, the, there's also like the ones that you're like, oh, this is great, but also problematic. But I feel something, but I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's a fair amount of Emma Frost like that.
<laughs> and then, then yeah. it's, that's another one where it's like mm, the reality of this would not play well. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Kay, I'm glad you said that because um, <laughs> no, no, I, I get it. I totally get that. Well, I feel like okay, all right, all right. So on the on the topic, I realize we got to get to the rest of the show, but you know what? We're gonna have this conversation right now. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're getting more and more of that with male characters in comics mm-hmm. nowadays. Um, not to say that it like. It it it's okay or it's bad or whatever because like if we're gonna oogle people we should oogle equally right yeah that's right this is what a tal- um, equality is for like that, sure sure like sure that Nicholas Scott image of Nightwing with his butt well yeah yeah and I mean that it's interesting <laughs> actually because, all of like, Nightwing with his butt but yeah go on but I feel like it's not as discouraged as the as drawing as uh, drawings of women nowadays. Um, which I, I think is interesting. I'm like, when are we going to get to that point where it's like, all right, all right, we got to stop sexualizing these men. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be a while, That's, Mike. It'll be a while. Yeah, I, I, I know. I know. This is still but new like, territory for most people. I think the I think the problem is that like it, it's so prevalent in a lot of the creators that I follow. Not that it's prevalent in comics in general. It's prevalent in my bubble of people, right? Where there's just a lot of like... Yeah, I drew this really hot-looking version of this character. You know, what does everybody think? And people are just drooling and crying on the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas I think if you look at the greater, like, comic sphere, you know, we're still probably vast majority of, like, oogled women. Which is why I get get so grossed out sometimes at Midtown because they still sell those books, like... Yeah. The Jungle Chita- Chitara book or something yeah. like that, mm. where like they have to black out the image because it's just a nude woman hanging out in a tree, and I'm like, who the <laughs> fuck is buying these comics? <laughs> like there is a string around Imagine her neck or something. Imagine climbing a tree was... with like bark nude. Yeah, like I, no, no, no. Or, or you've done it so much that your entire body is calloused. <laughs> yeah, <Ooh. laughs> that's <laughs> hot. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's the truth of it, Kate, is like, yes, there probably are, like, naked men and women that climb trees and do stuff like that, or there were at some point, but their bodies were just calluses. <laughs> just, just one just giant covered. callus. Calluses in places you don't ever want a callus to be. <laughs> Inner thigh callus. Uh. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, episode okay. title, Inner Thigh Callus. Yeah, no. <laughs> <And> we, <done. laughs> none of this is... <laughs> okay. 